Sega. Hello, good evening, and welcome to the latest Total War Warhammer campaign walkthrough video. Today it's the turn of the perfidious Warriors of Chaos. We're now 34 turns into a campaign, with the mighty Colex Sun Eater as our starting legendary lord, and in these early stages of the game we've been concerning ourselves mostly with conquering the frozen wastes of Norska. We began play with a single horde here in the Chaos Wastes led by Kolek, and we've steadily smashed our way westward along the northern coastline through the Norskan settlements, liberating their feeble-minded occupants from the pesky shackles of free will. Now we needn't have chosen to advance westward through Norska from the beginning. Our other possible route out of the Chaos Wastes is of course through the human lands of Kislev. Now this is a challenge as they're militarily strong to begin with and also have some well garrisoned cities too such as Prague here. However we're hedging our bets and we've stationed an exalted hero, Festergax Helrik here, to keep an eye on Kislev developments. You dare. As a chaos hero he'll passively spread chaos corruption which, if left unchecked, will begin to negatively affect public order and could ultimately lead to a chaos rebellion. This can cause an AI controlled chaos lord to rise with his army to challenge the region owner. And we can double down on this by deploying him in the region to further disrupt public order. If we can incite a rebellion or two, that will weaken the province and make it much easier to conquer later on when we're done with the Norskans. In fact, you can see some evidence of chaos corruption here with lava streams opening up in the landscape. And just south of there, the Golden Monolith, which is the site of one of Sigvald the Magnificent's quest battles. Now, the Lost Dwarfen clan of Krakadrak still holds a couple of settlements up here, one of them a walled stronghold with a moderate garrison. But we've bypassed them for now in favour of taking the Varg village of Winterpyre here, and you'll soon see why. Here's Kolek and his army facing off against a Chaos Sorcerer hero bound to the Norsken tribe of the Varg, and along the way we've spawned a new horde, led by this fellow, Ekugax the Astute, who is also a Law of Metal Sorcerer, and so we have the two hordes working in tandem as they move across the map. Ekugax is currently in the encampment stance to work on his infrastructure and replenish his units. And this enemy hero has been hindering our movement somewhat with his own special abilities, so let's attempt a quick and dirty assassination with our Chaos Sorcerer hero, currently embedded in Ekugax's army. He's not yet a great assassin, as you can see from the probabilities on show here. And unsurprisingly, that was a failure. We'll have to level him up a bit and unlock his zap skill to make him a more effective assassin in future. Now, as a race, the Chaos Warriors concern themselves only with the shedding of blood, and that is reflected in pretty much all of their features. If we look at their tech tree, we can see that it's serially populated with stat improvements for all the units in the Chaos Warriors roster. You'll need to expend the Chaos Currency of Favour with the Gods to access these various improvements, which cost increasingly hefty amounts. Once unlocked, these techs begin with basic Marauder and Warhound unit upgrades, with some post-battle income buffs sprinkled in too. The skills progress through the various improvements and cost reductions to mid and upper tier units such as Chaos Warriors, Chosen, Chariots and ultimately Dragon Ogres. This thirst for war is also reflected in their infrastructure. Chaos Warriors travel as hordes, which mean they bring their settlements with them. Once in camp, they can work on erecting and improving their building chains, and as you can see, there's no real civic virtue at play here. The Chaos Warriors building tree is devoted almost solely to the recruitment of units and heroes. The only real exception here is the palanquin of trophies, which offers some basic income. However, many of the building chains also bring recruitment and upkeep reductions to various units, and this is crucial if you're to stay afloat as the Chaos Warriors, as they make very little money via their infrastructure. This means that to maintain armies you're often running at a deficit, as we are now, but for the Chaos Warriors, significant income is generated by sacking, looting, raiding and winning battles, and this means you never want to sit still for too long. Horde structures are pretty quick to build, as we can see in Colex Horde here. Upgrading his tribal relic to a trial pit will take just a single turn. This is balanced by the fact that like all other races, Chaos Warriors need to generate population growth and ultimately surplus in order to build structures. Unlike other races, however, Chaos growth is not generated by buildings in their infrastructure. 
Instead, it comes from two key sources. The first is the Chaos Lord's skill tree. The Tribes of Chaos campaign skill here is key to getting your growth moving. The second is simply to raise settlements. This brings a further temporary boost to growth and gives you all the more reason to burn your enemy's settlements to the ground as it actively helps you develop your hordes. Back to the matter in hand though, which is the reason we've chosen to ignore the dwarves for now and head to the Varg settlement of Winter Pyre. OK, let's conquer this little Norsken settlement, which is a decidedly easy task given the tiny garrison and our overwhelming forces. So we've made a bit of money out of the encounter. And Kolek has ranked up a level 2. Now Chaos Warriors often get a further post-battle option when conquering Norsken settlements, which is to awaken the tribe. This option liberates the original owners of the settlement, in this case the Eastling, who were then bound pretty tightly to your will and entered into an immediate military alliance with you. And if we take a look at the diplomacy screen here, we can see that the Eastling are fairly staunchly allied to us, as are the Bersenling, who we also liberated earlier. Now that the Eastling are awakened to the power of chaos, this also gives us enhanced replenishment for our hordes in this region. This means we now have an area of respite on the map we can retreat to in order to lick our wounds after battle and supercharge our character and unit replenishment. Yes. And at this point you may have noticed those fiery particle effects on our two hordes. Now this is a sign that our hordes are suffering attrition and this is happening because their proximity to each other means that they're infighting. This creates a little tension for the player as it means you can't have your hordes right next to each other at all times so you'll have to be fairly strategic in their campaign map placement when you're on the move. OK, let's set them both to the encampment stance and they can crack on with a bit of infrastructure yes. development and recoup their losses with that enhanced Norsken replenishment rate before heading off again. Now, these really are the early stages of the Chaos campaign as victory requires you to destroy both Bretonia and the Empire, plus the Dwarfs as well if you choose to play for the long victory objectives. This means when we're done up here in Norska, we'll be heading southwards to sunnier climes to lay waste to civilization itself. Okay, that's all for now. We hope you've enjoyed this snapshot of Chaos Warriors campaign gameplay, and we'll be back with more walkthrough videos very soon.